Section 25 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13, Part 1. Jean Isbel, holding the wolf dog Shep in leash, was on the trail of the most dangerous of Jorth's gang, the gunman Queen. Dark drops of blood on the stones and plain tracks of a rider's sharp heeled boots behind coverts indicated the trail of a wounded, slow traveling fugitive. Therefore, Jean Isbel held in the dog and proceeded with the wary eye and watchful caution of an Indian. Queen, true to his class, and emulating Blue, with the same magnificent effrontery and with the same paralyzing suddenness of surprise, had appeared as if by magic at the last night camp of the Isbel faction. Jean had seen him first, in time to leap like a panther into the shadow, but he carried in his shoulder Queen's first bullet of that terrible encounter. Upon Gordon and Fredericks fell the brunt of Queen's fusillade, and they, shot to pieces, staggering and falling, held passionate grip on life long enough to draw and still Queen's guns and sent him reeling off into the darkness of the forest. Unarmed and hindered by a painful wound, Jean had kept a vigil near camp that silent and menacing night. Morning disclosed Gordon and Frederick stark and ghastly beside the burned-out campfire, their guns clutched immovably in stiffened hands. Jean buried them as best he could, and when they were underground with flat stones on their graves, he knew himself to be indeed the last of the Isbel clan. And all that was wild and savage in his blood and desperate in his spirit rose to make him more than man and less than human. Then for the third time during these tragic last days, the wolf-dog Shep came to him. Jean washed the wound Queen had given him and bound it tightly. The keen pang and burn of the lead was a constant and all-powerful reminder of the grim work left for him to do. The whole world was no longer large enough for him and whoever was left of the Jorths. The heritage of blood his father had bequeathed him, the unshakable love for a worthless girl who had so dwarfed and obstructed his will and so bitterly defeated and reviled his poor, romantic boyish faith, the killing of hostile men, so strange in its after-effects, the pursuits and fights, and loss of one by one of his confederates, these had finally engendered in Jean Isabel a wild, unslackable thirst. These had been the cause of his retrogression. These had unalterably and ruthlessly fixed in his darkened mind one fierce passion, to live and die the last man of that Jorth Isbel feud. At sunrise, Jean left this camp, taking with him only a small knapsack of meat and bread, and with the eager wild Shep in leash, he set out on Queen's bloody trail. Black drops of blood on the stones and an irregular trail of footprints proved to Jean that the gunman was hard hit. Here he had fallen or knelt or sat down, evidently to bind his wounds. Jean found strips of scarf, red and discarded, and the blood drops failed to show on more rocks. In a deep forest of spruce, under silver-tipped spreading branches, Queen had rested, perhaps slept. Then laboring with dragging steps, not improbably with a lame leg, he had gone on, up out of the dark green ravine, to the open, dry, pine-tipped ridge. Here he had rested, perhaps waited to see if he were pursued. From that point his trail spoke an easy language for Jean's keen eye. The gunman knew he was pursued. He had seen his enemy. Therefore Jean proceeded with a slow caution, never getting within revolver range of ambush, using all his woodcraft to trail this man, and yet save himself. Queen traveled slowly, either because he was wounded or else because he tried to ambush his pursuer and Jean accommodated his pace to that of Queen. From noon of that day they were never far apart, never out of hearing of a rifle shot. The contrast of the beauty and peace and loneliness of the surroundings 
to the nature of Queen's flight often obtruded its strange truth into the somber turbulence of Jean's mind, into that fixed columnar idea around which fleeting thoughts hovered and gathered like shadows. Early frost had touched the heights with its magic wand, and the forest seemed a temple in which man might worship nature and life rather than steal through the dells and under the arched aisles like a beast of prey. The green and gold leaves of aspens quivered in the glades. Maples in the ravines fluttered their red and purple leaves. The needle-matted carpet under the pines vied with the long lanes of silver grass, alike enticing to the eye of man and beast. Sunny rays of light flecked with dust and flying insects slanted down from the overhanging brown-limbed, green-massed foliage. Roar of wind in the distant forest alternated with soft breeze close at hand. Small dove-gray squirrels ran all over the woodland, very curious about Jean and his dog, rustling the twigs, scratching the barks of trees, chattering and barking, frisky, saucy, and bright-eyed. A plaintive twitter of wild canaries came from the region above the treetops. First voices of birds in their pilgrimage toward the south. Pine cones dropped with soft thuds. The blue jays followed these intruders in the forest, screeching their displeasure. Like rain pattered the dropping seeds from the spruce. A woody, earthy, leafy fragrance, damp with the current of life, mingled with a cool, dry, sweet smell of withered grass and rotting pines. Solitude and lonesomeness, peace and rest, wildlife and nature reigned there. It was a golden green region, enchanting to the gaze of man. An Indian would have walked there with his spirits. And even as Jean felt all this elevating beauty and inscrutable spirit, his keen eye once more fastened upon the blood-red drops Queen had again left on the gray moss and rock. His wound had reopened. Jean felt the thrill of the scenting panther. The sun set. Twilight gathered. Night fell. Jean crawled under a dense, low-spreading spruce, ate some bread and meat, fed the dog, and lay down to rest and sleep. His thoughts burdened him, heavy and black as the mantle of night. A wolf mourned a hungry cry for a mate. Shep quivered under Jean's hand. That was the call which had lured him from the ranch. The wolf blood in him yearned for the wild. Jean tied the cowhide leash to his wrist. When this dark business was at an end, Shep could be free to join the lonely mate morning out there in the forest. Then Jean slept. Dawn broke, cold, clear, frosty, with silvered grass sparkling, with a soft, faint rustling of fallen aspen leaves. When the sun rose red, Jean was again on the trail of Queen. By a frosty, ferned brook, where water tinkled and ran clear as air and cold as ice, Jean quenched his thirst, leaning on a stone that showed drops of blood. Queen, too, had quenched his thirst. What good, what help, Jean wondered, could the cold, sweet granite water, so dear to woodsmen and wild creatures, do this wounded, hunted rustler? Why did he not wait in the open to fight and face the death he had met it? Where was that splendid and terrible daring of the gunman? Queen's love of life dragged him on and on, hour by hour, through the pine groves and spruce woods, through the oak swales and aspen glades, up and down the rocky gorges, and around the windfalls and over the rotting logs. The time came when Queen tried no more ambush. He gave up trying to trap his pursuer by lying in wait. He gave up trying to conceal his tracks. He grew stronger, or, in desperation, increased his energy, so that he redoubled his progress through the wilderness. That, at best, would count only a few miles a day. And he began to circle to the northwest, back toward the deep canyon, where Blaisdell and Bill Isbel had reached the end of their trails. Queen had evidently left his comrades. He had lone-handed it in his last fight, but he was now trying to get back to them. 
Somewhere in these wild, deep forest breaks, the rest of the Jorth faction had found a hiding place. Jean let Queen lead him there. Ellen Jorth would be with them. Jean had seen her. It had been his shot that killed Coulter's horse. And he had withheld further fire because Coulter had dragged the girl behind him, protecting his body with hers. Sooner or later, Jean would come upon their camp. She would be there. The thought of her dark beauty, wasted in wantonness, upon these rustlers added a deadly rage to the bloodlust and righteous wrath of his vengeance. Let her again flaunt her degradation in his face, and, by the god she had forsaken, he would kill her, and so end the race of Jorths. Another night fell, dark and cold, without starlight. The wind moaned in the forest. Shep was restless. He sniffed the air. There was a step on his trail. Again a mournful, eager, wild, and hungry wolf cry broke the silence. It was deep and low, like that of a baying hound, but infinitely wilder. Shep strained to get away. During the night, while Jean slept, he managed to chew the cow-eyed leash apart and run off. Next day, no dog was needed to trail Queen. Fog and low-drifting clouds in the forest and a misty rain had put the rustler off his bearings. He was lost, and showed that he realized it. Strange how a mature man, fighter of a hundred battles, steeped in bloodshed and on his last stand, should grow panic-stricken upon being lost. So Jean Isbel read the signs of the trail. Queen circled and wandered through the foggy, dripping forest until he headed down into a canyon. It was one that notched the rim and led down and down, mile after mile, into the basin. Not soon had Queen discovered his mistake. When he did do so, night overtook him. The weather cleared before morning. Red and bright the sun burst out of the east to flood that low basin land with light. Jean found that Queen had traveled on and on, hoping, no doubt, to regain what he had lost. But in the darkness, he had climbed to the Manzanita slopes instead of back up the canyon. And here he had fought the hold of that strange brush of Spanish name until he fell exhausted. Surely Queen would make a stand and wait somewhere in this devilish thicket for Jean to catch up with him. Many and many a place Jean would have chosen had he been in Queen's place. Many a rock and dense thicket Jean circled or approached with extreme care. Manzanita grew in patches that were impenetrable except for a small animal. The brush was a few feet high, seldom so high that Jean could not look over it, and of a beautiful appearance, having glossy small leaves, a golden berry, and branches of dark red color. These branches were tough and unbendable. Every bush, almost, had low branches that were dead, hard as steel, sharp as thorns, as clutching as cactus. Progress was possible only by endless detours to find the half-closed aisle between patches, or else by crashing through with main strength or walking right over the tops. Jean preferred this last method, not because it was the easiest, but for the reason that he could see ahead so much farther. So he literally walked across the tips of the manzanita brush. Often he fell through, and had to step up again. Many a branch broke with him, letting him down, but for the most part he stepped from fork to fork, on branch after branch, with balance of an Indian and the patience of a man whose purpose was sustaining and immutable. On that south slope under the rim the sun beat down hot. There was no breeze to temper the dry air, and before midday Jean was laboring wet with sweat, parching with thirst, dusty and hot and tiring. It amazed him, the doggedness and tenacity of life shown by this wounded rustler. The time came when, under the burning rays of the sun, he was compelled to abandon the walk across the tips of the manzanita bushes and take to the winding open threads that ran between. It would have been poor sight, indeed, that he could not have followed Queen's labyrinthine and broken passage through the brush. Then the time came when Jean espied Queen, 
far ahead and above, crawling like a black bug along the bright green slope. Sight then acted upon Jean as upon a hound in the chase, but he governed his actions if he could not govern his instincts. Slowly but surely he followed the dusty hot trail, and never a patch of blood failed to send a thrill along his veins. Queen headed up toward the rim, finally vanished from sight. Had he fallen? Was he hiding? But the hour disclosed that he was crawling. Jean's keen eye caught the slow moving of the brush and enabled him to keep just so close to the rustler out of the range of the six shooters he carried. And so all the interminable hours of the hot afternoon that snail pace flight and pursuit kept on. Halfway up the rim, the growth of manzanita gave place to open, yellow, rocky slope dotted with cedars. Queen took to a slow ascending ridge and left his bloody tracks all the way to the top, where in the gathering darkness the weary pursuer lost them. Another night passed. Daylight was relentless to the rustler. He could not hide his trail, but somehow, in a desperate last rally of strength, he reached a point on the heavily timbered ridge that Jean recognized as being near the scene of the fight in the canyon. Queen was nearing the rendezvous of the rustlers. Jean crossed tracks of horses, and then more tracks that he was certain had been made days past by his own party. To the left of this ridge must be the deep canyon that had frustrated his efforts to catch up with the rustlers on the day Blaisdell lost his life and probably Bill Isbel, too. Something warned Jean that he was nearing the end of the trail, and an unaccountable sense of imminent catastrophe seemed foreshadowed by vague dreads and doubts in his gloomy mind. Jean felt the need of rest, of food, of ease from the strain of the last weeks, but his spirit drove him implacably. Queen's rally of strength ended at the edge of an open bald ridge that was bare of brush or grass and was surrounded by a line of forest on three sides, and on the fourth by a low bluff which raised its gray head above the pines. Across this dusty open, Queen had crawled, leaving unmistakable signs of his condition. Jean took long survey of the circle of trees and of the low rocky eminence, neither of which he liked. It might be wiser to keep the cover, Jean thought, and work around to where Queen's trail entered the forest again. But he was tired, gloomy, and his eternal vigilance was failing. Nevertheless, he stilled for the thousandth time that bold prompting of his vengeance, and, taking to the edge of the forest, he went to considerable pains to circle the open ground. And suddenly, sight of a man sitting back against a tree halted John. He stared to make sure his eyes did not deceive him. Many times stumps and snags and rocks had taken on strange resemblance to a standing or crouching man. This was only another suggestive blunder of the mind behind his eyes. What he wanted to see, he imagined he saw. Jean glided from tree to tree until he made sure that the sitting image indeed was that of a man. He sat bolt upright, facing back across the open, hands resting on his knees, and closer scrutiny showed Jean that he held a gun in each hand. Queen. At last his nerve had revived. He could not crawl any farther. He could never escape, so with the courage of fatality he chose the open to face his foe and die. Jean had a thrill of admiration for the rustler. Then he stalked out from under the pines and strolled forward with his rifle ready. A watching man could not have failed to espy Jean, but Queen never made the slightest move. Moreover, his stiff, unnatural position struck Jean so singularly that he halted with a muttered exclamation. He was now about fifty paces from Queen, within range of those small guns. Jean called sharply, Queen! Still the figure never relaxed in the slightest. Jean advanced a few more paces, rifle up, 
ready to fire the instant Queen lifted a gun. The man's immobility brought the cold sweat to Jean's brow. He stopped to bend the full intense power of his gaze upon this inert figure. Suddenly over Jean flashed its meaning. Queen was dead. He had backed up against the pine ready to face his foe, and he had died there. Not a shadow of a doubt entered Jean's mind as he started forward again. He knew, after all, Queen's blood would not be on his hands. Gordon and Fredericks in their death throes had given the rustler mortal wounds. Jean kept on, marveling the while, how ghastly, thin, and hard. Those four days of flight had been hell for Queen. Jean reached him, looked down with staring eyes. The guns were tied to his hands. Jean started violently as the whole direction of his mind shifted. A lightning glance showed that Queen had been propped against a tree. Another showed boot tracks in the dust. By heaven, they fooled me, hissed Jean, and quickly as he leaped behind the pine, he was not quick enough to escape the cunning rustlers, who had waylaid him thus. He felt the shock, the bite and burn of lead, before he heard a rifle crack. A bullet had ripped through his left forearm. From behind the tree, he saw a puff of white smoke along the face of the bluff, the very spot his keen and gloomy vigilance had descried as one of menace. Then several puffs of white smoke and ringing reports betrayed the ambush of the tricksters. Bullets barked the pine and whistled by. Jean saw a man dart from behind the rock and, leaning over, run for another. Jean's swift shot stopped him midway. He fell, got up, and floundered behind a bush scarcely large enough to conceal him. Into that bush Jean shot again and again. He had no pain in his wounded arm, but the sense of the shock clung in his consciousness, and this with the tremendous surprise of the deceit and sudden release of long-damned, overmastering passion caused him to empty the magazine of his Winchester in a terrible haste to kill the man he had hit. These were all the loads he had for his rifle. Blood passion had made him blunder. Jean cursed himself, and his hand moved to his belt. His six-shooter was gone. The sheath had been loose. He had tied the gun fast, but the strings had been torn apart. The rustlers were shooting again. Bullets thudded into the pine and whistled by. Bending carefully, Jean reached one of Queen's guns and jerked it from his hand. The weapon was empty. Both of his guns were empty. Jean peeped out again to get the line in which the bullets were coming, and, marking a course from his position to the cover of the forest, he ran with all his might. He gained the shelter. Shrill yells behind him warned that he had been seen, that his reason for flight had been guessed. Looking back, he saw two or three men scrambling down the bluff. Then the loud neigh of a frightened horse pealed out. End of chapter 13, part 1《6 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13, Part 2. Jean discarded his useless rifle and headed down the ridge slope, keeping to the thickest line of pines and shearing around the clumps of spruce. As he ran, his mind whirled with grim thoughts of escape, of his necessity to find the camp where Gordon and Fredericks were buried, there to procure another rifle and ammunition. He felt the wet blood dripping down his arm, yet no pain. The forest was too open for good cover. He dared not run uphill. His only course was ahead, and that soon ended in an abrupt declivity, too precipitous to descend. As he halted, panting for breath, he heard the ring of hoofs on stone. Then the thudding beat of running horses on soft ground. The rustlers had sighted the direction he had taken. Jean did not waste time to look. Indeed, there was no need, 
for as he bounded along the cliff to the right, a rifle cracked and a bullet whizzed over his head. It lent wings to his feet. Like a deer he sped along, leaping cracks and logs and rocks, his ears filled by the rush of wind, until his eye caught sight of thick-growing spruce foliage close to the precipice. He sprang down into the green mass. His weight precipitated him through the upper branches, but lower down his spread arms broke his fall, then retarded it until he caught. A long swaying limb led him down and down, where he grasped another and a stiffer one that held his weight. Hand over hand he worked toward the trunk of this spruce, and gaining it, he found other branches close together, down which he hastened, hold by hold and step by step, until above him was black, dense foliage, and beneath him the brown, shady slope. Sure of being unseen from above, he glided noiselessly down under the trees, slowly regaining freedom from that constriction of his breast. Passing on to a gray lichened cliff, overhanging and gloomy, he paused there to rest and to listen. A faint crack of hoof on stone came to him from above, apparently farther on to the right. Eventually his pursuers would discover that he had taken to the canyon but for the moment he felt safe. The wound in his forearm drew his attention. The bullet had gone clear through without breaking either bone. His shirt sleeve was soaked with blood. Jean rolled it back and tightly wrapped his scarf around the wound. Yet still the dark red blood oozed out and dripped down into his hand. He became aware of a dull, throbbing pain. Not much time did Jean waste in arriving at what was best to do. For the time being he had escaped, and whatever had been his peril, it was past. In dense, rugged country like this he could not be caught by rustlers. But he had only a knife left for a weapon, and there was very little meat in the pocket of his coat. Salt and matches he possessed. Therefore, the imperative need was for him to find the last camp, where he could get rifle and ammunition, bake bread, and rest up before taking again the trail of the rustlers. He had reason to believe that this canyon was the one where the fight on the rim, and later on a bench of woodland below, had taken place. Thereupon he arose and glided down under the spruces, toward the level grassy open he could see between the trees. And as he proceeded, with the slow step and wary eye of an Indian, his mind was busy. Queen had, in his flight, unerringly worked in the direction of this canyon until he became lost in the fog, and upon regaining his bearings, he had made a wonderful and heroic effort to surmount the Manzanita slope and the rim, and to find the rendezvous of his comrades. But he had failed up there on the ridge. In thinking it over, Jean arrived at a conclusion that Queen, finding he could go no farther, had waited, guns in hand, for his pursuer, and he had died in this position. Then, by strange coincidence, his comrades had happened to come across him, and recognizing the situation, they had taken the shells from his guns and propped him up with the idea of luring Jean on. They had arranged a cunning trick and ambush which had all but snuffed out the last of the Isbels. Coulter probably had been at the bottom of this crafty plan, since the fight at the Isbel Ranch, now seemingly far back in the past, this man Coulter had loomed up more and more as a stronger and more dangerous antagonist than either Jorth or Daggs. Before that, he had been little known to any of the Isbel faction. And it was Coulter now who controlled the remnant of the gang and who had Ellen Jorth in his possession. The canyon wall above Jean on the right grew more rugged and loftier, and the one on the left began to show wooded slopes and breaks, and at last a wide expanse with a winding willow border on the west and a long, low, pine-dotted bench on the east. It took several moments of study for Jean to recognize the rugged bluff above this bench. Up on that canyon several miles 
was the site where Queen had surprised John and his comrades at their campfire. Somewhere in this vicinity was the hiding place of the rustlers. Thereupon, Jean proceeded with the utmost stealth, absolutely certain that he would miss no sound, movement, sign, or anything unnatural to the wild peace of the canyon. And his first sense to register something was his keen smell. Sheep? He was amazed to smell sheep. There must be a flock not far away. Then, from where he glided along under the trees, he saw down to open places in the willow brake and noticed sheep tracks in the dark, muddy bank of the brook. Next he heard faint tinkle of bells, and at length, when he could see farther into the open enlargement of the canyon, his surprised gaze fell upon an immense gray, woolly patch that blotted out acres and acres of grass. Thousands of sheep were grazing there. Jean knew there were several flocks of Jorth's sheep on the mountain, in the care of herders, but he had never thought of them being so far west, more than twenty miles from Chevalon Canyon. His roving eyes could not descry any herders or dogs, but he knew there must be dogs close to that immense flock, and whatever his cunning, he could not hope to elude the scent and sight of shepherd dogs. It would be best to go back the way he had come, wait for darkness, then cross the canyon and climb out, and work around to his objective point. Turning at once, he started to glide back, but almost immediately he was brought stock still and thrilling by the sound of hoofs. Horses were coming in the direction he wished to take. They were close. His swift conclusion was that the men who had pursued him up on the rim had worked down into the canyon. One circling glance showed him that he had no sure covert near at hand. It would not do to risk their passing him there. The border of woodland was narrow and not dense enough for close inspection. He was forced to turn back up the canyon in the hope of soon finding a hiding place or breaking the wall where he could climb up. Hugging the base of the wall, he slipped on, passing the point where he had espied the sheep, and gliding on until he was stopped by a bend in the dense line of willows. It sheared to the west there and ran close to the high wall. Jean kept on until he was stooping under a curling border of willow thicket, with branches slim and yellow and masses of green foliage that brushed against the wall. Suddenly he encountered an abrupt corner of rock. He rounded it to discover that it ran at right angles with the one he had just passed. Peering up through the willows, he ascertained that there was a narrow crack in the main wall of the canyon. It had been concealed by willows low down and leaning spruces above, a wild hidden retreat. Along the base of the wall there were tracks of small animals. The place was odorous, like all dense thickets, but it was not dry. Water ran through there somewhere. Jean drew easier breath. All sounds except the rustling of birds or mice in the willows had ceased. The break was pervaded by a dreary emptiness. Jean decided to steal on a little farther, then wait till he felt he might safely dare go back. The golden-green gloom suddenly brightened. Light showed ahead, and parting the willows, he looked out into a narrow, winding canyon, with an open, grassy, willow-streaked lane in the center, and on each side a thin strip of woodland. His surprise was short-lived. A crashing of horses back of him in the willows gave him a shock. He ran out along the base of the wall, back of the trees. Like the strip of woodland in the main canyon, this one was scant and had but little underbrush. There were young spruces growing with thick branches clear to the grass, and under these he could have concealed himself. But with the certainty of sheepdogs in the vicinity, he would not think of hiding except as a last resource. These horsemen, whoever they were, were likely to be sheep herders as not. Jean slackened his pace to look back. He could not see any moving objects, but he still heard horses, though not so close now. Ahead of him, this narrow gorge opened out like the neck of a bottle. He would run on to the head of it, 
and find a place to climb to the top. Hurried and anxious as Jean was, he received an impression of singular wild nature of this side gorge. It was a hidden, pine-fringed crack in the rock-ribbed and canyon-cut tableland. Above him, the sky seemed a winding stream of blue. The walls were red and bulged out in spruce-greened shelves. From wall to wall was scarcely a distance of a hundred feet. Jumbles of rocks obstructed his close holding to the wall. He had to walk at the edge of the timber. As he progressed, the gorge widened into wilder, ruggeder aspect. Through the trees ahead, he saw where the wall circled to meet the cliff on the left, forming an oval depression, the nature of which he could not ascertain. But it appeared to be a small opening, surrounded by dense thickets and the overhanging walls. Anxiety augmented to alarm. He might not be able to find a place to scale those rough cliffs. Breathing hard, Jean halted again. The situation was growing critical again. His physical condition was worse. Loss of sleep and rest, lack of food, the long pursuit of Queen, the wound in his arm, and the desperate run for his life, these had weakened him to the extent that if he undertook any strenuous effort he would fail. His cunning weighed all chances. The shade of wall and foliage above, and another jumble of ruined cliff, hindered his survey of the ground ahead, and he almost stumbled upon a cabin, hidden on three sides, with a small bare clearing in front. It was an old ramshackle structure, like others he had run across in the canyons. Cautiously he approached, and peeped around the corner. At first swift glance, it had all the appearance of long disuse. But Jean had no time for another look. A clip-clop of trotting horses on hard ground brought the same pell-mell rush of sensations that had driven him to wild flight scarcely an hour past. His body jerked with its instinctive impulse, then quivered with his restraint. To turn back would be risky, to run ahead would be fatal. To hide was his one hope. No covert behind, and the clip-clop of hoofs sounded closer. One moment longer Jean held mastery over his instincts of self-preservation. To keep from running was almost impossible. It was the sheer primitive animal sense to escape. He drove it back, and glided along the front of the cabin. Here he saw the cabin adjoined another. Reaching the door, he was about to peep in when the thud of hoofs and voices close at hand transfixed him with a grim certainty that he had not an instant to lose. Through the thin, black streak line of trees he saw moving red objects. Horses, he must run. Passing the door, his keen nose caught a musty, woody odor, and the tail of his eye saw a bare dirt floor. The cabin was unused. He halted, gave a quick look back, and the first thing his eye fell upon was a ladder, right inside the door, against the wall. He looked up. It led to a loft that, dark and gloomy, stretched halfway across the cabin. An irresistible impulse drove Jean. Slipping inside, he climbed up the ladder to the loft. It was like night up there. But he crawled on the rough-hewn rafters, and, turning with his head toward the opening, he stretched out and lay still. What seemed an interminable moment ended with a trample of hoofs outside the cabin. It ceased. Jean's vibrating ear caught the jingle of spurs and a thud of boots striking the ground. "'Well, sweetheart, here we are home again,' drawled a slow, cool, mocking Texas voice. Home? I wonder, Coulter, did you ever have a home, a mother, a sister, much less a sweetheart? Was the reply bitter and caustic. Jean's palpitating, hot body suddenly stretched still and cold with intensity of shock. His very bones seemed to quiver and stiffen into ice. During the instant of realization, his heart stopped, and a slow, contracting pressure enveloped his breast and moved up to constrict his throat. That woman's voice belonged to Ellen Jorth. 
the sound of it had lingered in his dreams. He had stumbled upon the rendezvous of the Jorth faction. Hard indeed had been the fates meted out to those of the Isbels and Jorths who had passed to their deaths. But no ordeal, not even Queen's, could compare with this desperate one Jean must endure. He had loved Ellen Jorth strangely, wonderfully, and he had scorned repute to believe her good. He had spared her father and her uncle. He had weakened or lost the cause of the Isbels. He loved her now, desperately, deathlessly, knowing from her own lips that she was worthless, loved her the more because he had felt her terrible shame, and to him, the last of the Isbels, had come the cruelest of dooms. To be caught like a crippled rat in a trap, to be compelled to lie, helpless, wounded, without a gun, to listen, and perhaps to see Ellen Jorth enact the very truth of her mocking insinuation. His will, his promise, his creed, his blood must hold him to the stern decree that he should be the last man of the jorth Isbel War. But could he lie there to hear, to see, when he had a knife and an arm? End of chapter 13, part 2《Seven of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, Part 1. Then followed the leathery flop of saddles to the soft turf and the stamp of loosened horses. Jean heard a noise at the cabin door, a rustle, and then a knock of something hard against wood. Silently, he moved his head to look down through a crack between the rafters. He saw the glint of a rifle leaning against the sill. Then the doorstep was darkened. Ellen Jorth sat down with a long, tired sigh. She took off her sombrero, and the light shone on the rippling dark brown hair, hanging in a tangled braid. The curved nape of her neck showed a warm tint of golden tan. She wore a gray blouse, soiled and torn, that clung to her lissom shoulders. Colter, what are you going to do? she asked suddenly. Her voice carried something Jean did not remember. It thrilled into the icy fixity of his senses. We'll stay here, was the response, and it was followed by a clinking step of spurred boot. Sure I won't stay here, declared Ellen. It makes me sick when I think of how Uncle Tad died in there alone, helpless, suffering. The place seems haunted. Well, I'll agree that it's tough on you. But what the hell can we do? A long silence ensued, which Ellen did not break. Something has come off round here since early morning, declared Coulter. Summers and Springer haven't got back, and Antonio's gone. Now, honest, Ellen, didn't you hear rifle shots off somewhere? I reckon I did, she responded gloomily. And which way? Sounded to me, up on the bluff, back pretty far. Well, sure, that's my idea and it makes me think hard. You know Summers came across the last camp of the Isbels, and he dug into a grave to find the bodies of Jim Gordon and another man he didn't know. Queen kept good as brag. He braced that Isbel gang and killed those fellas, but either him or Jean Isbel went off, leaving bloody tracks. If it was Queen's, you can bet Isbel was after him, and if it was Isbel's tracks, why sure Queen would stick to them. Summers and Springer couldn't follow the trail. They're sure not much good at tracking. But for days they've been riding the woods, hoping to run across Queen. Well, now, maybe they run across Isbel instead. And if they did and got away from him, they'll be here sooner or later. If Isbel was too many for them, he'd hunt for my trail. I'm gambling that either Queen or Jean Isbel is dead. I'm hoping it's Isbel. Because if he ain't dead... He's the last of the Isbels, and maybe I'm the last of the Jorth gang. Sure, I'm not hankering to meet the half-breed. That's why I say we'll stay here. This is as good a hiding place as there is in the country. We've grub. There's water and grass. Me stay here with you alone? The tone seemed a contradiction to the apparently accepted sense of her words. Jean held his breath. 
but he could not still the slowly mounting and accelerating faculties within that were involuntarily rising to meet some strange, nameless import. He felt it. He imagined it would be the catastrophe of Ellen Jorth's calm acceptance of Coulter's proposition. But down in Jean's miserable heart lived something that would not die. No mere words could kill it. How poignant the moment of her silence! How terribly he realized that if his intelligence and his emotion had believed her betraying words, his soul had not. But Ellen Jorth did not speak. Her brown head hung thoughtfully. Her supple shoulders sagged a little. Ellen, what's happened to you? went on Coulter. All the misery possible to a woman, she replied dejectedly. Sure, I don't mean that way, he continued persuasively. I ain't gainsaying the hard facts of your life. It's been bad. Your dad was no good. But I mean, I can't figure the change in you. No, I reckon you can't, she said. Whoever was responsible for your makeup left out a mind, not to say feeling. Coulter drawled a low laugh. Well, have that your own way. But how much longer are you going to be like this here? Like what? she rejoined sharply. Well, this standoffishness of yours. Coulter, I told you to let me alone, she said sullenly. Sure, and you did that before. But this time you're different, and, well, I'm getting tired of it. Here, the cool, slow voice of the Texan sounded an inflexibility before absent, a timber that hinted of illimitable power. Ellen Jorth shrugged her lithe shoulders, and slowly rising, she picked up the little rifle and turned the step into the cabin. Coulter, she said, fetch my pack and my blankets in here. Sure, he returned with good nature. Jean saw Ellen Jorth lay the rifle lengthwise in a chink between two logs, and then slowly turn back to the wall. Jean knew her then, yet did not know her. The brown flash of her face seemed that of an older, graver woman. His strained gaze, like his waiting mind, had expected something he knew not what. A hardened face, a ghost of beauty, a recklessness, a distorted, bitter, lost expression in keeping with her fortunes. But he had reckoned falsely. She did not look like that. There was incalculable change, but the beauty remained somehow different. Her red lips were parted, her brooding eyes looking out straight from under the level, dark brows, seemed slow black and wonderful with her steady, passionate light. Jean, in his eager, hungry, devouring of the beloved face, did not on the first instant grasp the significance of its expression. He was seeing the features that had haunted him, but quickly he interpreted her expression as the somber, hunted look of a woman who would bear no more. Under the torn blouse her full breast heaved, she held her hands clenched at her sides. She was listening, waiting, for that jangling, slow step. It came, and with the sound she subtly changed. She was a woman hiding her true feelings. She relaxed, and that strong, dark look of fury seemed to fade back into her eyes. Coulter appeared at the door, carrying a roll of blankets and a pack. "'Throw them here,' she said, and I reckon... You needn't bother coming in. That angered the man. With one long stride, he stepped over the door still, down into the cabin, and flung the blankets at her feet and then the pack after it. Whereupon, he deliberately sat down in the door facing her. With one hand, he slid off his sombrero, which fell outside, and with the other, he reached into his upper vest pocket for the little bag of tobacco that showed there. All the time he looked at her. By the light now unobstructed, Jean descried Coulter's face, and the sight of it then sounded the roll and drum of his passions. "'Well, Ellen, I reckon we'll have it out right now and here,' he said, and with tobacco in one hand, paper in the other, he began the operations of making a cigarette. However, he scarcely removed his glance from her. "'Yes?' queried Ellen Jorth. I'm going to have things the way they were before, and more, he declared. 
The cigarette paper shook in his fingers. "'What do you mean?' she demanded. "'You know what I mean,' he retorted. Voice and action were subtly unhinging this man's control over himself. "'Maybe I don't. I reckon you'd better talk plain.' The rustler had clear, gray-yellow eyes, flawless like crystal, and suddenly they danced with little fiery flecks. The last time I laid my hand on ye, I got hit for my pains, and sure that been ranklin. Coulter, you'll get hit again if you put your hands on me, she said, dark, straight glance on him. A frown wrinkled the level brows. You mean that, he asked thickly. I sure do. Manifestly, he accepted her assertion. Something of the incredulity and bewilderment that had vied with his resentment utterly disappeared from his face. "'Here I've been waiting for you to love me,' he declared, with a gesture not without dignified emotion. "'Your giving in without that wasn't so much to me.' And at these words of the rustlers, Jean Isabel felt an icy, sickening shudder creep into his soul. He shut his eyes. The end of his dream had been long in coming, but at last it had arrived. A mocking voice, like a hollow wind, echoed through that region, that lonely and ghost-like hall of his heart, which had harbored faith. She burst into speech, louder and sharper, the first words of which Jean's strangely throbbing ears did not distinguish. You? I never gave in to you, and I never will. But, girl, I kissed you, hugged you, handled you, he expostulated, and the making of the cigarette ceased. Yes, you did, you brute. When I was so downhearted and weak, I couldn't lift my hand, she flashed. Ah, you mean I couldn't do that now? I should smile, I do, Jim Coulter, she replied. Well, maybe I see presently, he went on, straining with words. But I'm sure curious. Dags, then. He was nothing to you? No more than you, she said morbidly. He used to run after me, long ago, it seems. I was only a girl then, innocent, and I'd not known any but rough men. I couldn't, all the time, every day, every hour, keep him at arm's length. Sometimes, before I knew, I didn't care. I was a child. A kiss meant nothing to me. But after I knew... Ellen dropped her head in brooding silence. So do you expect me to believe that, he queried, with a derisive leer. Bah! What do I care what you believe, she cried, with lifting head. How about Sim Bruce? That coyote? He lied about me, Jim Coulter. And any man, half a man, would have known he lied. Well, Sim always bragged about you being his girl, asserted Coulter. And he wasn't over particular about details of your love making. Ellen gazed out of the door, over Coulter's head, as if the forest out there was a refuge. She evidently sensed more about the man than appeared in his slow talk, in his slouching position. Her lips shut in a firm line, as if to hide their trembling and to still her passionate tongue. Jean, in his absorption, magnified his perceptions. Not yet was Ellen Jorth afraid of this man, but she feared the situation. Jean's heart was at bursting pitch. All within him seemed chaos a wreck of beliefs and convictions. Nothing was true. He would wake presently out of a nightmare. Yet, as surely as he quivered there, he felt the imminence of a great moment, a lightning flash, a thunderbolt, a balance struck. Coulter attended to the forgotten cigarette. He rolled it, lighted it, all the time with lowered, pondering head. And when he had puffed the cloud of smoke, he suddenly looked up with face as hard as flint, eyes as fiery as molten steel. Well, Ellen, how about Jean Isabel, our half-breed Nez Pierce friend, who was sure seen handling you familiar, he drawled. Ellen Jorth quivered as under a lash. Her brown face turned a dusty scarlet that, slowly receding, left her pale. Damn you, Jim Coulter, she burst out furiously. I wish John Isabel would jump in that door or down out of that loft. He killed Greaves for defiling my name. He'd kill you for your dirty insult. And I'd like to watch him do it, you cold-blooded Texan. 
You thieving rustler, you liar. You lied about my father's death, and I know why. You stole my father's gold, and now you want me. You expect me to fall into your arms. My heaven, can't you tell a decent woman? Was your mother decent? Was your sister decent? Bah, I'm appealing to deathness. But you hear this, Jim Coulter. I'm not what you think I am. I'm not the, the damned hussy you liars have made me out. I'm a Jorth, alas. I've no home, no relatives, no friends. I've been forced to live my life with rustlers, vile men like you and Dags, and the rest of your like. But I've been good. Do you hear that? I am good. So help me God. And you and all your rottenness can't make me bad. Coulter lounged to his tall height, and the laxity of the man vanished. Vanished also was John Isabel's suspended icy dread. The cold clogging of his fevered mind vanished in a white, living, leaping flame. Silently he drew his knife and lay there watching with eyes of a wildcat. The instant Coulter stepped far enough over toward the edge of the loft, Jean meant to bound erect and plunge down upon him. But Jean could wait now. Coulter had a gun at his hip. He must never have a chance to draw it. "'And so you wish Jean Isabel would hop in here, do you?' queried Coulter. "'Well, if I had any pity on you, that's done for it.' A sweep of his long arm so swift Ellen had no time to move, brought his hand in clutching contact with her, and the force of it flung her half across the cabin room, leaving the sleeve of her blouse in his grasp. Panting, she put out that bared arm and her other to ward him off as he took long, slow strides toward her. Jean rose half to his feet, dragged almost by ungovernable passion to risk all in one leap. But the distance was too great. Coulter, blind as he was to all outward things, would hear, would see in time, to make Jean's effort futile. Shaking like a leaf, Jean sank back, eye again to the crack between the rafters. Ellen did not retreat, nor scream, nor move. Every line of her body was instinct with fight, and the magnificent blaze of her eyes would have checked a less callous brute. Coulter's big hand darted between Ellen's arms and fastened in the front of her blouse. He did not try to hold her or draw her close. The unleashed passion of the man required violence. In one savage pull, he tore off her blouse, exposing her white, rounded shoulders and heaving bosom, where instantly a wave of red burned upward. Overcome by the tremendous violence and spirit of the rustler, Ellen sank to her knees with blanched face and dilating eyes, trying with folded arms and trembling hand to hide her nudity. At that moment, the rapid beat of hoofs on the hard trail outside halted Coulter in his tracks. Hell, he exclaimed, and who's that? With a fierce action, he flung the remnants of Ellen's blouse in her face and turned to leap out the door. Jean saw Ellen catch the blouse and tried to wrap it around her, while she sagged against the wall and stared at the door. The hoofbeats pounded to a solid, thumping halt just outside. "'Jim, there's hell to pay,' rasped out a panting voice. "'Well, Springer, I reckon I wish you'd paid it without spoiling my deals,' reported Coulter, cool and sharp. "'Deals, huh? You'll be forgetting your lady love in a minute,' replied Springer, when I catch my breath. Where's Summers? demanded Coulter. I reckon he's all shot up, if my eyes didn't fool me. Where is he? yelled Coulter. Jimmy's lying up in the bushes round that bluff. I didn't wait to see how he was hurt, but he sure stopped some lead, and he flopped like a chicken with its head cut off. Where's Antonio? He run like the greaser he is, declared Springer disgustedly. Ah, and where's Queen? queried Coulter after a significant pause. Dead. End of chapter 14, part 1《28 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, part 2 
The silence ensuing was fraught with a suspense that held Jean in cold bonds. He saw the girl below rise from her knees, one hand holding the blouse to her breast, the other extended, and with strange, repressed, almost frantic look, she swayed toward the door. "'Well, talk,' ordered Coulter harshly. "'Jim, there ain't a hell of a lot,' replied Springer, drawing a deep breath, "'but what there is is sure interesting. Me and Summers took Antonio with us. He left his woman with the sheep. And we rode up the canyon, clumb out on top, and made a circle back on the ridge. That's the way we've been hunting for tracks. Up there in a bare spot, we run plumb into Queen, sitting against a tree, right out in the open. Queer sight you ever seen. The damn gunfighter had sat down to wait for Isabel, who was trailing him, as we suspected. And he died there. He wasn't cold when we found him. Summers was quick to see a trick, so he propped Queen up and tied the guns to his hands, and Jim, the queerest thing about that deal was this. Queen's guns was empty, not a shell left. It beat us holler. We left him there and hid up high on the bluff, maybe a hundred yards off. The horses we left back of a thicket, and we waited there for a long time. But sure enough, the half-breed come. He was too smart, too much engine. He would not cross the open, but went around. And then he seen Queen. It was great to watch him. After a little, he shoved his rifle out and went right for Queen. This is when I wanted to shoot. I could have plugged him, but Summer says wait and make it sure. When Isbel got up to Queen, he was sort of half hid by a tree. I couldn't wait no longer, so I shot. I hit him, too. We all begun to shoot. Summer showed himself, and that's when Isbel opened up. He used up a whole magazine on Summers, and then, sudden-like, he quit. It didn't take me long to figure maybe he was out of shells. When I seen him run, I was certain of it. Then we made for the horses and rode after Isbel. Pretty soon I seen him running like a deer down the ridge. I yelled and spurred after him. There's where Antonio quit me. But I kept on, and I got a shot at Isbel. He ran out of sight. I followed him by spots of blood on the stones and grass until I couldn't trail him no more. He must have gone down over the cliffs. He couldn't have done nothing else without me seeing him. I found his rifle, and here it is to prove what I say. I had to go back to climb down off the rim, and I rode fast down the canyon. He's somewhere along that west wall, hiding in the brush. Hard hit, if I know anything about the color of blood. Well, that beats me holla too, ejaculated Coulter. Jim, what's to be done? inquired Springer eagerly. If we're sharp, we can corral that half-breed. He's the last of the Isbels. More, pard. He's the last of the Isbel outfit, declared Coulter. If you can show me blood in his tracks, I'll trail him. You can bet I'll show you, rejoined the other rustler. But listen. Wouldn't it be better for us first to see if he crossed the canyon? I reckon he didn't, but let's make sure. And if he didn't, we'll have him somewhere along the West Canyon wall. He's not got no gun. He'll never run that way if he had. Jim, he's our meat. Sure, he'll have that knife, pondered Coulter. We needn't worry about that, said the other positively. He's hard hit, I tell you. All we gotta do is find that bloody trail again and stick to it. Going careful. He's laying low like a crippled wolf. Springer, I want the job of finishing that half-breed, his Coulter. I'll give ten years of my life to stick a gun down his throat and shoot it off. All right, let's rustle. Maybe you'll not have to give much more than ten minutes, because I tell you I can find him. It's been easy, but Jim, I reckon I was afraid. Leave your horse for me and go ahead, the rustler then said brusquely. I've got a job in the cabin here. Ha, ha. Well, Jim, I'll rustle a bit down the trail and wait. No hunting John Isbel alone, not for me. I've had a queer feeling about that knife he used on Greaves, and I reckon you ought to let that Jorth hussy alone long enough to... 
Springer, I reckon I've got the hog tire. His voice became indistinguishable, and footsteps attested to a slow moving away of the men. Jean had listened with ears acutely strung to catch every syllable, while his gaze rested upon Ellen, who stood beside the door. Every line of her body denoted a listening intensity. Her back was toward Jean, so that he could not see her face. And he did not want to see. But he could not help seeing her naked shoulders. She put her head out of the door. Suddenly, she drew it in quickly and half turned her face, slowly raising her white arm. This was the left one, and bore the mark of Coulter's hard fingers. She gave a little gasp. Her eyes became large and staring. They were bent on the hand that she had removed from a step on the ladder. On hand and wrist showed a bright red smear of blood. Jean, with a convulsive leap of his heart, realized that he had left his bloody tracks on the ladder as he had climbed. That moment seemed the supremely terrible one of his life. Ellen Jorth's face blanched and her eyes darkened and dilated, with exceeding amaze and flashing thought to become fixed with horror. That instant was the one in which her reason connected the blood on the ladder with the escape of Jean Isbel. One moment she leaned there, still as a stone except for her heaving breast, and then her fixed gaze changed to a swift, dark blaze, comprehending yet inscrutable, as she flashed it up the ladder to the loft. She could see nothing, Yet she knew, and Jean knew that she knew, he was there. A marvelous transformation passed over her features, and even over her form. Jean choked with the ache in his throat. Slowly, she put the bloody hand behind her, while with the other, she still held the torn blouse to her breast. Coulter's slouching musical step sounded outside, and it might have been a strange breath of infinitely vitalizing and passionate life blown into the wellsprings of Ellen Jorth's being. Isbel had no name for her then. The spirit of a woman had been to him a thing unknown. She swayed back from the door against the wall in singular, softened poise, as if all the steel had melted out of her body. And as Coulter's tall shadow fell across the threshold, John Isabel felt himself staring with eyeballs that ached, straining incredulous sight at this woman who in a few seconds had bewildered his senses with her transfiguration. He saw, but could not comprehend. "'Jim, I heard all Springer told you,' she said. The look of her dumbfounded Coulter, and her voice seemed to shake him visibly. "'Suppose you did. What then?' he demanded harshly, as he halted with one booted foot over the threshold. Malignant and forceful, he eyed her darkly, doubtfully. "'I'm afraid,' she whispered. "'What, of me?' "'No, of, of John Isbel. He might kill you, and then where would I be?' "'Well, I'm damned,' ejaculated the rustler. "'What's got into you?' He moved to enter, but a sort of fascination bound him. "'Jim, I hated you a moment ago,' she burst out. "'But now, with that John Isbel somewhere near, hiding, watching to kill you, and maybe me too, I, I don't hate you any more. Take me away. Girl, have you lost your nerve, he demanded. My God, Coulter, can't you see, she implored. Won't you take me away? I sure will, presently, he replied grimly. But you'll wait till I've shot the lights out of this Isbel. No, she cried. Take me away now, and I'll give in. I'll be what you want. You can do with me as you like. Coulter's lofty frame leaped, as if at the release of bursting blood. With a lunge, he cleared the threshold to loom over her. "'Am I out of my head, or are you?' he asked, in low, hoarse voice. His darkly corded face expressed extreme amaze. "'Jim, I mean it,' she whispered, edging an inch nearer him, her white face uplifted, her dark eyes unreadable in their eloquence and mystery. I've no friend but you. I'll be yours. I'm lost. What does it matter? If you want me, take me now, before I kill myself. Ellen Jorth, 
There's something wrong about you, he responded. Did you tell the truth when you denied ever being a sweetheart of Sim Bruce? Yes, I told you the truth. Uh-huh. And how do you account for laying me out with every dirty name you could give tongue to? Oh, it was temper. I wanted to be let alone. Temper? Well, I reckon you've got one, he retorted grimly. And I'm not sure you're not crazy or lying. An hour ago I couldn't touch you. You may now, if you promise to take me away at once. This place has got on my nerves. I couldn't sleep here with that Isbel hiding round. Could you? Well, I reckon I'd not sleep very deep. Then let us go. He shook his lean, eagle-like head in slow, doubtful vehemence, and his piercing gaze studied her distrustfully. Yet all the while there was manifest in his strung frame an almost irrepressible violence held in abeyance to his will. That about you are being so good, he inquired, with a return of the mocking draw. Never mind what's past, she flashed, with passion dark as his. I've made my offer. Sure there's a lie about you somewhere, he muttered thickly. Man, could I do more, she demanded in scorn. No, but it's a lie, he returned. You'll get me to take you away, and then fool me, run off. God knows what. Women are all liars. Manifestly, he could not believe in her strange transformation. Memory of her wild, passionate denunciation of him and his kind must have seared even his callous soul. But the ruthless nature of him had not weakened nor softened in the least as to his intentions. This weather vane veering of hers bewildered him, obsessed him with its possibilities. He had the look of a man who was divided between love of her and hate, whose love demanded a return, but whose hate required a proof of her abasement. Not proof of surrender, but proof of her shame. The ignominy of him thirsted for its like. He could grind her beauty under his heel, but he could not soften to this feminine inscrutableness. And whatever was the truth of Ellen Jorth in this moment, beyond Coulter's gloomy and stunted intelligence, beyond even the love of John Isbel, it was something that held the balance of mastery. She read Coulter's mind. She dropped the torn blouse from her hand and stood there, unashamed, with a wave of her white breast pulsing, eyes black as night and full of hell, her face white, tragic, terrible, yet strangely lovely. Take me away, she whispered, stretching one white arm toward him, then the other. Coulter, even as she moved, had leaped with inarticulate cry and radiant face to meet her embrace. But it seemed, just as her left arm flashed up toward his neck, that he saw her bloody hand and wrist. Strange how that checked his ardor. Threw up his lean head, like that striking bird of prey. Blood? What the hell, he ejaculated, and in one sweep he grasped her. How'd you do that? Are you cut? Hold still. Ellen could not release her hand. I scratched myself, she said. Where? All that blood? And suddenly he flung her hand back with fierce gesture, and the gleams of his yellow eyes were like the points of leaping flames. They pierced her, read the secret falsity of her, Slowly he stepped backward, guardedly, his hand moved to his gun, and his glance circled and swept the interior of the cabin. As if he had a nose of a hound in sight to follow scent, his eyes bent to the dust of the ground before the door. He quivered, grew rigid as stone, and then moved his head with exceeding slowness, as if searching through a microscope in the dust. Farther to the left, to the foot of the ladder, and up one step, another a third, all the way up to the loft. Then he whipped out his gun and wheeled to face the girl. Ellen, you've got your half-breed here, he said with a terrible smile. She neither moved nor spoke. There was a suggestion of collapse, but it was only a change where the alluring softness of her hardened into a strange, rapt glow. And in it seemed the same mastery that had characterized her former aspect. Herein the treachery of her was revealed. 
She had known what she meant to do in any case. Coulter, standing at the door, reached a long arm toward the ladder, where he laid his hand on a rung. Taking it away, he held it palm outward for her to see the dark splotch of blood. See? Yes, I see, she said ringingly. Passion wrenched him, transformed him. All that about leaving here with me, about giving in, was a lie. No, Coulter, it was the truth. I'll go yet, now, if you'll spare him. She whispered the last word, and made a slight movement of her hand toward the loft. Girl, he exploded incredulously, you love this half-breed, this Isbel, you love him. With all my heart, thank God, it has been my glory. It might have been my salvation. But now I'll go to hell with you, if you'll spare him. Damn my soul, rasped out the rustler, as if something of respect was wrung from that sordid deep of him. You, you woman, Jorth will turn over in his grave. He'll rise out of his grave, if this Isabel got you. Hurry, hurry, implored Ellen. Springer may come back. I think I heard a call. Well, Ellen Jorth, I'll not spare Isabel nor you, he returned, with dark and meaning leer, as he turned to ascend the ladder. John Isabel, too, had reached the climax of his suspense. Gathering all his muscles in a knot, he prepared to leap upon Coulter as he mounted the ladder. But Ellen Jorth screamed piercingly and snatched her rifle from its resting place, and cocking it, she held it forward and low. Coulter! Her scream and his uttered name stiffened him. You'll spare Jean Isabel, she rang out. Drop that gun, drop it. Sure, Ellen, easy now. Remember your temper. I'll let Isabel off. He panted huskily, and all his body sank quiveringly to a crouch. Drop your gun. Don't turn round, Coulter. I'll kill you. But even then he failed to divine the meaning and the spirit of her. Oh, now, Ellen, he entreated, in louder, huskier tones, as if dragged by fatal doubt of her still, he began to turn. Crash! The rifle emptied its contents in the Coulter's breast. All his body sprang up. He dropped the gun. Both hands fluttered toward her and an awful surprise flashed over his face. "'So help me God,' he whispered, with blood thick in his voice. Then darkly, as one groping, he reached for her with shaking hands. "'You, you white-throated hussy, I'll—' He grasped the quivering rifle barrel. Crash! She shot him again. As he swayed over her and fell, she had to leap aside, and his clutching hand tore the rifle from her grasp. Then in convulsion he writhed, to heave on his back and stretch out, a ghastly spectacle. Ellen backed away from it, her white arms wide, a slow horror blotting out the passion of her face. Then from without came a shrill call and the sound of rapid footsteps. Ellen leaned against the wall, staring at Coulter. "'Hey, Jim, what's the shooting?' called Springer, breathlessly. As his form darkened the doorway, Jean once again gathered all his muscular force for a tremendous spring. Springer saw the girl first, and he appeared thunderstruck. His jaw dropped. He needed not the white gleam of her person to transfix him. Her eyes did that, and they were riveted in unutterable horror upon something on the ground. Thus instinctively directed, Springer espied Coulter. You, you've shot him, he shrieked. What for, you hussy? Ellen Jorth, if you've killed him, I'll... He strode toward where Coulter lay. Then Jean, rising silently, took a step, and like a tiger he launched himself into the air, down upon the rustler. Even as he leaped, Springer gave a quick upward look, and he cried out. Jean's moccasined feet struck him squarely and sent him staggering into the wall where his head hit hard. Jean fell, but bounded up as the half-stunned Springer drew his gun. Then Jean lunged forward with a single sweep of his arm and looked no more. Ellen ran swaying out of the door, and once clear of the threshold, she tottered out on the grass to sink to her knees. 
The bright golden sunlight gleamed upon her white shoulders and arms. Jean had one foot out of the door when he saw her, and he whirled back to get her blouse. But Springer had fallen upon it. Snatching up a blanket, Jean ran out. Ellen, 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 he cried, it's over. And reaching her, he tried to wrap her in the blanket. She wildly clutched his knees. Jean was conscious only of her white, agonized face and the dark eyes with their look of terrible strain. "'Did you? Did you?' she whispered. "'Yes, it's over,' he said gravely. "'Ellen, the Isbel Jorth feud is ended.' "'Oh, thank God!' she cried in breaking voice. "'Jean, you're wounded. The blood on the step. "'My arm. See, it's not bad. "'Ellen, let me wrap this round you.' Folding the blanket around her shoulders, he held it there and entreated her to get up. But she only clung closer. She hid her face on his knees. Long shudders rippled over her, shaking the blanket, shaking Jean's hands. Distraught, he did not know what to do, and his own heart was bursting. "'Ellen, you must not kneel there that way,' he implored. "'Jean, Jean,' she moaned and clung the tighter. He tried to lift her up, but she was a dead weight, and with that hold on him seemed anchored at his feet. "'I killed Coulter,' she gasped. "'I had to kill him. I offered to fling myself away. "'For me,' he cried poignantly. "'Oh, Ellen, Ellen, the world has come to an end. "'Hush, don't keep saying that. "'Of course you killed him. You saved my life.' for I'd never have let you go off with him. Yes, you killed him. You're a Jorth, and I'm an Isbel. We've blood on our hands, both of us. I for you, and you for me. His voice of entreaty and sadness strengthened her, and she raised her white face, loosening her clasp to lean back and look up. Tragic, sweet, despairing, the loveliness of her, the significance of her there on her knees, thrilled him to his soul. "'Blood on my hands,' she whispered. "'Yes, it was awful, killing him. But all I care for in this world is for your forgiveness and your faith that saved my soul.' "'Child, there's nothing to forgive,' he responded. "'Nothing. Please, Ellen.' "'I lied to you,' she cried. "'I lied to you.' "'Ellen, listen, darling.' And the tender epithet brought her head and arms back close-pressed to him. I know now, he faltered on. I found out today what I believed. And I swear to God, by the memory of my dead mother, down in my heart, I never, never believed what they, what you, tried to make me believe. Never. Jean, I love you, love you, love you, she breathed, with exquisite, passionate sweetness. Her dark eyes burned up into his. Ellen, I can't lift you up, he said in trembling eagerness, signifying his crippled arm. But I can kneel with you. End of chapter 14, part 2. Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. End of To the Last Man by Zane Gray.